So this video is going to pick up uh, where I left off in the previous admissions video. And we're going to start by talking about some of the general principles that all financial aid has to abide by. So in this instance, when we're reviewing the source of funds, that's going to tell us what type of legal remedies or legal um, principles apply to federal financial aid. The most specific is the most obvious is contract law. And in this instance, it's a contract between the student or the parent on the amount of money, the repayment method, as well as the interest rate. There may be other requirements that are um, stated in the contract that are terms of the financial aid. So it all just depends on public, private, for-profit, non-profit, federal, parent plus loans, and the variety to determine what the guidelines of the contract law is. Now, in financial aid is the biggest way that institutions uphold due process and follow the federal government's um, regulations in terms of the Constitution, statutes, and the like. And this is how private and public institutions are required to follow due process clause. Now, when we get into private gifts, there are specific conditions that they must adhere to, and they must be explicit at the time of gift. So if a private donor wants to give $5,000 for specific scholarships, they can't give the money and they come back later and say, oh no, that wasn't how we intended the money to be spent. They need to be very explicit at the time, and the institution needs to adhere to the conditions that were laid out for the gift. Now, if the state or the public institution is going to um, house the grant or the, the scholarship, then it has to abide by all state and federal regulations. Otherwise, um, the requirements could violate the federal constitution. I'm going to talk about that um, here in a few, few moments. The next is grants and program regulations. When an institution receives a grant, they need to follow all of the specific regulations, follow-ups, and, and, and the like. The same is true with wills and trusts. Um, same thing as private gifts. The conditions need to be outlaid, and they'll typically be outlaid upon um, the expiration of a, of a person. Um, or if a trust is set up for specific people, it's usually housed by a third party um, to monitor the trust. And that gets us into race, sex, or religion. And a lot of times when scholarships are based specifically on race, sex, or religion, they are privately administered because an institution that receives federal funds cannot grant money that is based on race because that's discrimination. But a privately administered, administered grant can. Now, if you look at region or location or GPA or some other general factors that may serve a specific population, that can be done. And a lot of the same principles that we talked about in admissions apply here as well. And when we have a privately administered grant that is administered in conjunction with, say, the Director of Financial Aid, then we're getting into state action doctrine. And if you think about that scale, we're moving more towards the public realm, which means that they need to abide by public policy. Now, in terms of federal programs, FERPA and um, other non-discrimination clauses are regulated by financial aid. It's the way they regulate the institution, and we've talked a lot about a lot about that. And an institution is eligible for financial aid by offering a minimum of an associate's degree or the equivalent um, that meets federal requirements for program length. They promise to comply with the Higher Education Act, section or Title VI specifically, which authorizes the Federal Student Assistance Program, and it also creates all the regulations an institution must follow. And then they need to certify compliance with various laws, such as the Clery Act, Campus Security Act, Students' Right to Know, etc. And all of this is done by a certifying agreement between the Secretary of Education uh, and the institution that says we will abide by all of these requirements in order to receive federal funds. Now proprietary institutions can apply and receive federal, fund, uh, federal financial aid as well if their instruction is at least 15 weeks and prepares a student for gainful employment in a recognized occupation. Um, they also must meet specific completion rates and placement rates and, and some other things that they have to do, but um, for-profit institutions can get federal aid. Now again, they must follow the same type of regulations private and public institutions do if they do this. Now, there are ways that a student can lose financial aid. 
And what are these ways? Well, if they're convicted of drug charges, the first offense equals a one-year loss of federal aid, the second offense is two years lost, and the third offense is that they can no longer get financial aid. Other ways is if they withdraw from the institution, um, but they still have to pay back what they got, or if they're considered um, not engaged, um, then the institution can withdraw the financial aid, and there's some specific requirements in terms of what not engaged means. Now, in terms of non-discrimination, a lot of the same legal principles apply that apply to admissions, and that's the 14th Amendment, the American Disability, Title VI, Title IX, Section 504A, the Age Discrimination Act, and a lot of these we've already talked about, so I'm not going to go into depth of them again, but essentially, federal financial aid cannot be discriminated against for race, sex, disability, gender, um, or age. It needs to be um, open to all for whatever reason. Now, the same principles could apply for the compelling state interest if there is a compelling state interest to give financial aid to one group of people over another group of people, but I'm going to talk more about that here specifically in a second when it comes to allocations of funds. Now, in terms of Title IX, Title IX is very explicit in financial aid, and Title IX prohibits an institution from limiting el eligibility of financial aid based on sex, as well as providing different amounts based on sex, listing different criteria based on sex, and it also um, prohibits the facilitation of discrimination by facilities use, advertising, or soliciting um, federal financial aid. So there's a lot of regulations when it comes into federal financial aid and a lot of ways that the government tries to ensure that access is available for everybody. Now, just like um, specific factors can't be used to exclude people based on admission, the same is true for financial aid. And many cases have ruled that state-sponsored scholarships are restricted from solely awarding scholarships based on standardized tests um, because women and other minorities are you know, known to score lower than majority or males. So it's important that we have specific scholastic measures that are holistic in nature when considering financial aid, particularly scholarships and grants. Now, I mentioned the allocations of funds before, and this is very important because allocations, institutions may allocate funds to students based on race, but they need to be careful on how they do it. So for an example, an institution that reserves 60% of its financial aid for minorities and 15% of their students are cons of the incoming class are considered minorities. Well, that's considered unconstitutional because that leaves 40% of the funds left for 85% of the students. So, within that category of funds, it needs to be dependent upon need. It can't just be based on race. And the catching point was that non-minority students with the same financial need as minority students ended up receiving less financial aid when the allocations of funds are, are done this way. So you have 85%, say if they're all white students, well, you could say 60% of them have a financial need, but they're not getting it because they're white. So it's very, very, very important that the allocations of funds are dispersed by need within specific groups. But what is still unclear is whether or not federal aid distribution um, that takes on a race-neutral voluntary affirmative action policy would be upheld. And we talked a lot about that in admissions. So if an institution um, has a race-neutral policy, but they're still trying to increase the amount of financial aid for a minority population, the way they can go about doing that hasn't been addressed in the court. So that, that's still um, up in the air. Now this concludes the financial aid video. Um, so now I want you to review course then, uh, refer back to the reading, and then answer the discussion question. And that will be um, our class. So see you all next week.